Can I have your attention, everyone? <laughs> That's a B flat for those who don't have perfect pitch. Not every scientific breakthrough on the Big Bang Theory came from Sheldon's whiteboard. Sometimes the show nailed the science so perfectly that real scientists applauded. And other times, well, let's just say they laughed for the wrong reasons. Uh, Dr. Cooper, I think there might be something wrong with our connection. Uh, no, I hear you fine. Welcome to Dr. Vibo, and today we're breaking down 10 scientific moments from the Big Bang Theory and deciding whether they were surprisingly real or totally fake. Some of these scenes could show up in a real physics classroom, others, they'd make Einstein roll over in his grave. So instead of supersymmetry, it would be super asymmetry? <gasps> super asymmetry, that's it! Number 10, Howard becomes an astronaut. I got great news. NASA picked my team's design for the deep field space telescope that's going on the International Space Station this spring. Howard Wolowitz always dreamed of going to space. And in season five, NASA calls him up to join a mission to the International Space Station as a payload specialist. Someone has to go up with the telescope as a payload specialist, and guess who that someone is? Muhammad Lee. Heartwarming? Yes. Scientifically believable? Absolutely not. Howard suffers from asthma, multiple nut allergies, and idiopathic arrhythmia, conditions that would immediately disqualify him from astronaut training. NASA's requirements are incredibly strict, and spaceflight would pose huge medical risks. Still, it gave us some great comedic moments, even if real NASA officials probably winced. Well, I heard you were thinking about going back up to the space station. And as someone who's been there with you, well, you know how astronauts need to have the right stuff? Sure. The stuff you have is wrong. Number nine, the Archimedes Eureka story. Anyway, she takes off all of her clothes, climbs into the hot tub, and the first thing I notice... The water level rose. <laughs> no. Well, of course it did. Yeah, it's said that Archimedes, the ancient Greek mathematician, discovered the principle of displacement while taking a bath. In a classic Sheldon moment, he retells the ancient story of Archimedes discovering displacement in his bathtub. But while bathing, Archimedes realized he could immerse the crown and measure the amount the water rose. And surprisingly, the science checks out. The king of Syracuse wanted to know whether his golden crown was pure gold. Archimedes noticed that the water level rose when he entered the tub, leading to a way to calculate the crown's volume. The show recounts the legend accurately, even if Sheldon's guests don't appreciate the historical nudity involved. This is one of the rare times the show gets ancient science exactly right. When he finished, he shouted, Eureka! No, I always shout, holy moly. <laughs> don't know why, just do. <laughs> Number eight the helium prank. When Barry Kripke pumps helium into a radio studio as a prank, Sheldon's voice becomes hilariously squeaky. Can you explain to our audience just what a monopole is? Of course. Consider an ordinary magnet, which has, as even the most uneducated in your audience must know, two poles. <laughs> Funny? Yes. Scientifically realistic? Nope. To change the pitch of someone's voice that dramatically, you'd need to fill the room with enough helium to displace the oxygen entirely, which would be deadly. Sheldon wouldn't sound squeaky, he'd pass out. Uh, Dr. Cooper, I think there might be something wrong with our connection. Uh, no, I hear you fine. Thankfully, the show keeps it lighthearted, even if the physics says, don't try this at home or anywhere. A requirement for string theory, <laughs> or M theory, if you will, is the Number seven, Sheldon confronts Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, Sheldon, I want you to meet Neil deGrasse Tyson from the Hayden Planetarium in New York. I'm quite familiar with Dr. Tyson. He's responsible for the demotion of Pluto from planetary status. Sheldon meets Neil deGrasse Tyson and immediately confronts him about killing Pluto. And here's the shocking part. The show gets all the details right. Pluto had. Why do you think people want to name it a Pl uh, planet? Pluto again? had it coming from the beginning. It was. It was like. It was never really belong. Pluto's orbit crosses that of another planet. That's no kind of behavior for a planet. Tyson did publicly support Pluto's demotion to dwarf planet status, leading to a surprising amount of hate mail. His real-life role at the Hayden Planetarium lines up perfectly with the episode. I liked Pluto. <laughs> Ergo, I do not like you. Sheldon declaring, I do not like you, remains one of the funniest uses of real astrophysics in the series. I actually didn't demote Pluto. That was a vote of the International Astronomical Union. If ifs and buts were candy and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. <laughs> Number six, 
the Nobel Prize process. Oh my gosh, it's from Fermilab in Chicago. Ah, not surprising, the windy city. Great flag town. No, no, it's about our paper. A team of physicists confirmed super asymmetry. Our paper was right, we did it. In season 12, Sheldon and Amy's paper on super asymmetry is confirmed almost instantly, and suddenly they're candidates for the Nobel Prize. In reality, not a chance. Scientific review takes years, dozens, if not hundreds, of researchers would have to check the theory before anyone even whispers the word Nobel. And the nomination process is handled by elite committees, not a couple of scientists from Fermilab. A super asymmetry could be the breakthrough that gets us there. But we can't fight over credit, we have to work together. So, you're saying that the four of us should just agree to share this discovery? A great storyline, but one that makes real researchers groan. And if anybody tells you you can't, don't listen. Number five. Schrodinger's cat explained. Sheldon, do you have anything to say that has anything to do with, you know, what I'm talking about? Well, let's see. We might consider Schrodinger's cat. Sheldon's explanation of Schrodinger's famous thought experiment, involving a cat both alive and dead until observed, is surprisingly precise. Schrodinger. Is that the woman in 2A? No, that's Mrs. Grossinger. And she doesn't have a cat. She has a Mexican hairless, annoying little animal. Yep, yep, Sheldon! <laughs> The experiment critiques the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, and the show nails the concept perfectly while using it as dating advice for Penny and Leonard. In 1935, Erwin Schrodinger, he proposed an experiment where a cat is placed in a box with a sealed vial of poison that will break open at a random time. Since no one knows when or if the poison has been released, until the box is opened, the cat can be thought of as both alive and dead. It's one of the moments where sitcom humor and quantum physics meet in beautiful harmony. Just like Schrodinger's cat, your potential relationship with Leonard right now can be thought of as both good and bad. It is only by opening the box that you'll find out which it is. Number four, super asymmetry. There's something I need to tell you. Wow, you look amazing. Sheldon and Amy excitedly invent a new physics theory, super asymmetry. My equations have been trying to describe an imperfect world, and the only way to do that is to introduce imperfection into the underlying theory. So instead of super symmetry, it would be super asymmetry? Super asymmetry, that's it! Fun idea, but totally made up. In real science, only supersymmetry exists, and it's complex, heavily studied, and still unproven. If the show's writers actually came up with a legitimate new physics theory, they deserve a real Nobel Prize. A creative twist for TV, but not something you'd find in a research journal. Everyone's waiting, what are you guys doing? Super asymmetry. Super asymmetry, is that a thing? We're inventing it right now. Number three, Galileo and the Pope. Why Don't you ever you speak to me again. When Sheldon compares his fight with Leonard to the Pope's conflict with Galileo... So you and Leonard... Oh, dear God. A little misunderstanding, huh? A little misunderstand... Galileo and the Pope had a little misunderstanding. <laughs> it's not just a joke, it's historically accurate. Galileo did argue that the Earth revolved around the Sun, contradicting church doctrine, and he was indeed placed under house arrest. The show gets the timeline and details right, even referencing Galileo's relationship with Pope Urban VIII. How do you feel? I don't understand the question. <laughs> no, I'm just asking if it's difficult to be fighting with your best friend. Oh, I hadn't thought about it like that. I wonder if I've been experiencing physiological manifestations of some sort of unconscious emotional turmoil. It's a surprisingly informed moment packed into a petty roommate argument. Number two, Sheldon and the mystery note. I would like to propose a toast to my best friend, Dr. Leonard Hofstadter. He has been presented with a wonderful opportunity and I couldn't be happier for him. When Sheldon strikes a champagne glass and confidently declares the note to be a B flat. Um, can I have your attention, everyone? <laughs> That's a B flat for those who don't have perfect pitch. The show intentionally slips in an error. It's actually a B natural. The frequency depends on the glass's shape, material, and how full it is, meaning Sheldon is, shockingly, wrong. The gag works because it's exactly the kind of tiny slip-up he'd obsess over if someone else made it. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. 
Number one, the whiteboard equations. Someone touched my board. <laughs> oh God, my board. <laughs> Here's the most scientifically impressive detail in the whole series. Every equation on Sheldon's whiteboard is real. Look at the beta function of quantum chromodynamics. The sign's been changed. Uh, yeah. But doesn't that fix the problem you've been having? Are you insane? Are you out of your mind? Are you, hey, look, that fixes the problem I've been having. The show hired UCLA physicist Dr. David Salzberg to fill in the math correctly, update the formulas each season, and even add inside physics jokes, including the Galileo reference. No fake scribbles, no random symbols, just genuine physics integrated into a sitcom script. I guess we don't need this anymore. <sighs> it's the kind of scientific accuracy that makes the show beloved by real researchers around the world. So, which scientific moment surprised you the most? The ones that nailed it, or the ones that completely missed the mark? Let me know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe to Dr. Vibo. Thanks for watching. I love science. Einstein, Stephen Hawking, Mike deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> Mike deGrasse Tyson? Yeah, you know, the boxer who grew a mustache and became a scientist. <laughs>